have to have some insight as to what's going on in the book of Job uh, to understand where it picks up here. Uh, this is, it picks up like in the middle of something happening. And unless you really know what was going on, it kind of, what is he talking about here? You know, it's a real downer of a reading. But the um, book of Job is one of the wisdom books of the Old Testament. And um, scholars call it a poem. It's kind of written in a poem. And it's, it's, uh, it's made up of several dialogues that go on. You know, Job has been given all of these uh, uh, calamities or maladies or whatever uh, as the devil is, is testing him. Now, it, give a little history about that. We may have talked about this in the past, but Satan in the past, his name being pronounced Satan, was a member of the royal court of heaven. And many people don't realize that because we picture Satan as we know Satan today. But he, he was the adversary, so to speak. In other words, you've heard of the expression devil's advocate. So if you said something, uh, you know, Deacon Dan is a good guy, you know, the devil would say, well, I don't really know about that. Let me go out and try to prove if he is. That's what goes on with Job. So, uh, you know, first read of Job, it's kind of annoying. At least I found it annoying. I thought, is God playing games with this poor guy? Like he's beating him up like crazy. But in the beginning of the book, God is, is saying how pleased he is with Job because he's a righteous man. You know, and the Satan is saying, nah, everybody's got a price. Not so fast. So God says, well, you can challenge him, but you can't kill him, but you can challenge him. And so Job is given all of these major life problems let's say i don't want to go into the whole book of job but he's been given this made these major um life problems and three of his friends come to talk to him and his friends in the conversation are attempting to convince him that he's suffering these issues because somewhere along the line he has sinned and job is saying nah, not i don't see where you see, so if you start to read the beginning of the book, you see this dialogue going on right uh, in the book. And so this the book really describes an innocent man's experience of suffering. And it starts to bring in the questions of how can the just suffer if God is just. And that's the, that's the premise of the of the story. So in the end, only faith of in God and submission to God's will rather than complete understanding all right because it's really impossible for us to totally understand you know uh, where god's at but uh, uh, complete complete uh giving ourselves completely to his will can we have a proper response to the mystery of suffering so that's the premise of the book so what happens here he's been listening to his friends right and now we come on he's had enough okay now also let me say we don't know who the author of this book is as well all right uh in the ancient jewish writings the talmud it says that moses was the author but we don't really know who this is uh some of the early christian writers say that could be but there's no and there's really no evidence that identify uh who the writer of job is so but the scholars say that this is written somewhere between 600 and 400 before Christ. So it's that old a writing. So what we're going to hear now, again, is this excerpt, as I said, from, from Job. Uh, we just recalled his story. So we know that if you read from the beginning of Job, you know, he's very, very successful. He's a very successful man. And um, he has a good family. He has good friends. He has wealth. He has a strong relationship with God. But through this test, okay, he loses everything through this test. Now, I want to bring that word test up again because uh, there has been discussion at least a year or so ago, and I haven't heard much of it since, but changing the interpretation of the Our Father. Because the interpretation says, lead us not into temptation. And the challenge has been, God doesn't lead us into temptation. Well, which is true. But when you look at the um, the translations, if that read, lead us not into the test, it would make sense because that's what this is. This is the test. This is testing the loyalty of Job to God. 
So I don't know where that ever went with the translation change. I know there was a big uproar about it. I didn't understand the uproar because again, if you um, if you have availability to the ancient language and you see that word test, then it made sense to me. Lead us not into the test because I knew of the book of Job and Job is being tested. So we're saying Job is Job's test is so difficult. Dad, don't, don't, don't lead us into that, please, you see. So having said that, I don't know where that's gone, but we've heard no more word of it. But um, again, God allows Satan to test Job. And as I said, three of his friends come to comfort him. But their comforting words are, you did something wrong. This doesn't happen to righteous people. So, you know, you did something wrong. You see, so um, in the first reading here, we hear of a piece of Job's reply to one of his friends. And what he's doing is he's describing the bleakness of his situation, is what he's describing, okay? Um, a few verses later, if this went on, you would see that his attention turns to God and that he has no um, uh, problem complaining to God, talking to God like you and I are talking today. He has no problem saying, hey, what, like, what's the deal here? You know, he has no problem complaining to God. But he, the, 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 the thing here, the strong point here is he never speaks falsely against God. He never loses his connection to God, his righteous connection. So having said that, then, who would want to read the first three verses here? I know it's Saturday morning. Let's jump in here, guys. <laughs> Deacon Dan, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead, Deacon Dan. <laughs> Is not life on earth a drudgery? It stays like those of a hireling. Like a slave who longs for the shade, a hireling who waits for wages. So I have been assigned months of futility, and troubled nights have been counted off for me. How many of us can say that this morning? <laughs> this morning? <laughs> you know, is not life on earth a drudgery? You know, like when that alarm went off this morning, like, oh, I got to get up. What are we doing here? You know, <laughs> And Nancy's yelling to me, come on, you got Bible study. You got to get up. You know, you know, this is so true to us. But let me explain where he's coming from with this. All right. He stopped listening to his friends, as I said. And now he turns to the theme of his lament. All right. He's comparing human life. Now, you have to, again, think of where he is in the culture and whatnot. He compares human life in general to forced military service. That's what he's talking about here. In other words, you're forced into military service here, you see, or the work of a day laborer, which is very hard. See, when you're forced into military service, you're told what to do and you don't have any choice. This is what you do and that's it. And as a day laborer, again, the work is very, very hard. And also simple slavery. Now we have to be careful here when we talk about slavery and sacred scripture, versus slavery in the uh, 1800s, you know, the 1700s, 1800s, uh, not the same thing. Slavery in the in sacred scripture is someone who, uh, for whatever reason, uh, is working as a servant to someone. Now, it might be that they owed the person a debt, and so they're working off the debt, you know, or something like that. It's not like uh, what we, our minds immediately go to slavery, and we think of, um, the slave ships, all right, coming to to the colonies and bringing slaves. Not the same thing. Uh, as I said, it, it may be that the, the family had a debt or there was some other issue that was owed and the person is working it off, so to speak. So there's a broader brush using this term. But he uses these in, in his uh, three verses here to paint a picture of how difficult life is. And so he's given them a visual. That would be the best way to describe it because they would know what the military service was like. They would definitely know uh, what being hired by somebody to do work was like. All right? And they're waiting for their wages, just wages, we hope. You know, So that's the picture that he paints for them as far as that's how he views his life at this particular point. In other words, there's no way out. Everything is being laid on to him. Okay. 
Any questions or comments with that? All right. Job is not an easy read. So if you choose to read the entire book of Job, take your time. You kind of have to break it up because it's a lot, it's a lot of these discussions. You know, and there is, as I said, when I first read Job without having any in-depth theological knowledge of what was going on, I thought it was kind of an odd book. I found it a, a bit depressing, to be quite frank with you. But then as you went through it and you saw what was going on and then you see how Job comes out at the other end, but it makes sense. It, 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 it makes sense. So any questions or comments on this? Yes. Uh, I see Angela. Why? Angela. So why knowing that that word slave can be very polarizing in this day and age or really any probably any day and age yep why is it still used why is there not another word chosen um used in the scripture you mean mm -hmm. okay scripture it's properly used when it came forward to us it took on a whole different meaning just like anything in language, okay? That's why I said when we study scripture, we go back to what did it mean in that day, not what it meant today. Because if we take today's definition to some of the terminology, it completely changes what the meaning is. So we're looking at the word slave in that time, not here, you see. Slave here was they went over and they either bought or they stole, all right, uh, people you know, from Africa and other foreign lands, and they imprisoned them and brought them here, and they worked under imprisonment, so to speak, you see. That's not the understanding of the word back in that day. That's why when we study sacred scripture, I always take the word back to the time, because, and I'll use this example, I've used it a million times, the word gay used to be a great word. It's even in our Christmas carols, but don't call somebody gay today, because our meaning now has completely changed that. So you have to go back to where the word was originally used in its proper context. So here in sacred scripture, it's its proper context. So if you were a slave, another translation would be a servant. You know, So you are brought into servanthood to someone for some reason. And as I said before, it could have been that um, you owed a debt uh, or somebody in your family owed a debt or you're working off the debt or whatever. You know, um, That would be the reason why you would go into that. Uh, back in the 1600s, actually before slavery came, before slavery as we know it came here, in the early 1600s, like 1609, 1602, uh, uh, to somewhere around there, you had the indentured servants, which were the people from Ireland that were brought here for the same purpose. Now, they were called indentured servants, but technically it was the same as slavery because they were brought here and they were, you know, that's it. You worked on, on the, you worked the land or wherever, you know. Uh, you look at um, the Old South, for example. Now, there they have slavery, as we, as we understand it. But before that, they had indentured servants from Ireland that were brought over from Ireland uh, to work the fields or do whatever. And they, in, but they were slaves in reality, is what they were. But the term for, that, for the term for them was indentured servant, which, of course, it sounds nice, okay, until you look it up and see what what, what did that mean, you know? So yes, Angela. What? Um... I'm, this is making me think of um, like when St. Paul writes and he says, brothers and sisters, a lot of Bibles will have the asterisk and you go down and look and it said, the original said brothers. So in my mind, I've always assumed that translators started adding and sisters like in the seventies to like appease the feminists That's and true. make everyone feel good about themselves. So um that's why I wonder why slavery and slave hasn't been changed to servant or servanthood or indentured but servant. It may, it may down the road. What you're talking about is what I call inclusive language. And the scripture that I use, I mean, I take this right from the uh, USCCB, so we all have the same paperwork. But the Bible I use is uh, an older one that doesn't use inclusive language because I don't like it. You know, anyone that takes my courses understands that when I say mankind, I mean men and women. I, I usually say that right up in front, like, don't stop me and say, you should say humankind, or you should say, no, I'm not, I'm not going there. You know, to me, it's mankind. And so, yes, that, that brothers and sisters, yeah, that's adding inclusive language. So it was not just picked up as being brothers. But again, when you go back to the period, right, or if you went to the Holy Land now, all right, and you went to the Great Wall, to the Wailing Wall, the, uh, uh, the Western Wall, 
the women are on one side and the men are on another and the women can't cross over. So when Paul preached, his audience was brothers, okay, you see. But as, as, the, uh, as the scholars began to interpret scripture, they said, no, sac if Jesus is for everybody, sacred scripture is for everybody, you see. So, but now today we get into this inclusive language. I was at a mass uh, actually where uh, one of the sisters, um, when it came time to pray the Our Father, she prayed Our Father and Mother who art in heaven. Uh, did not go over well. As a matter of from what I it was a Benedictine uh, uh, conference, and what from what I understand, uh, very quickly a letter went to Rome, and very quickly a letter came back from Rome, and said, "No, you know you don't add inclusive language to that. You see, the hour covers everything. You see, uh, but uh, you, Angela, you're right on this. Is that we are, we're seeing a big movement now uh, in the new in the new editions of the Bible." Okay, like uh, the the uh, Catholic Study Bible now. I think they're on the seventh or the eighth edition. I think I'm using the fourth because they started to get into this inclusive language. And personally, I just don't care for it. You know? And I find it difficult to constantly interrupt my teaching to say, by the way, we mean this or we mean this or we mean that. So usually, when I start a class, I let everyone know, don't send the emails. You know, don't complain. <laughs> This is how it works. You know, we are talking about both, you see. And the same thing with slavery, because even at the, at the Last Supper, what does Jesus say to the disciples that are there with him? He said, I called you slaves, but now I called you friends. In other words, he called them his servants, okay? Servants in the ministry, but now they're friends. So he's not saying, I called you slaves as men in chains, all right, who are imprisoned. No, you're servants. I call you. Know, I call you. you know, I call you servants. But now you're friends. You see. So it's a. It's a. Um, the truer meaning of the word slave, back in the day, and I will always do that. I will always take the language backwards because, as we move forward, uh, language changes, and these meanings take on um, very, very different meanings to us. You know. So that's that. That's the clarification for there. So. As I said, slave has a broader brush. When we brought it to North America, it took on a very um, evil, okay, it took a very evil uh, understanding um, where they had no rights, right? And as I, if you look at the example I gave that um, a slave could be working off a debt, it doesn't mean he has no rights. You know, he's working off a debt or whatever, you know, whatever transpired that, caused him to be a servant to this person or to this business. So that's how I look at that in the ancient times. But as I said, it does change as it comes forward. Sadly, it changes as it comes forward. But we always, in sacred scripture, we always have to explain a word that has a harsher meaning today than it might have back in the time. And we always have to take a look at that and see exactly. And, and we have to understand the culture too, that the women were not permitted to speak in public. Uh, and I, that's probably gave the example of the Wailing Wall, the Western Wall, is that the women stay on the one side and the men are on the other. And we were there one year when we had a when they had a wedding, and the women were on one side by themselves, and the men were dancing together on the other. That's the culture. That's that's the way that is. So they've kept that ancient. The Orthodox have kept that ancient culture, that ancient split. You see, but as the um, as the uh, uh, scholars go through sacred scripture. Yeah, they're making those corrections, all right? And sometimes when you're reading your Bible, you will see uh, in parentheses, you will see words. That means the editor you know, went in and put a clarification so you understand what they're talking about. It doesn't mean that all of a sudden, uh, you know, Mark decided, ah, they might not understand this. Let me put this in parentheses. No, no, no. That's one of the scholars coming in and saying, well, I want to clarify what this is. You know? um, and if you saw the, uh, ancient manuscripts, for example, and I teach this in the scripture class that I teach that you will see in the ancient manuscripts, you'll see in the uh, in the margins where one of the scholars will write, leave this word alone, this is correct, okay, or this word means this, so they're clarifying for us what this means, you know, so uh, we get a better, we get a good translation of it, okay, anyone else here? Okay, I see that uh, Ashfaq and, and his family from Pakistan have clicked in here, you know, so good to see you all. 
Nice to see you. Glad we can make the connection. We don't always have those connections, but it's great to see them. Okay. So let's look at uh, four. Who wants to read verse four for us? Go ahead, Lauren. When I lie down, I say, when shall I arise? Then the night drags on. I am filled with restlessness until the dawn. Okay. So again, we're going back to here, his military uh, reference here. All right. He, he's really still thinking that isn't the life of man on earth a soldier's service? You see? And what he's saying here, too, is the point he's trying to make is that an army has to fight, but that's not all that it does. It submits to a lot of hardships, a lot of hardships. And that's what the point he's trying to make. He's trying, he's painting the picture of all these hardships that he has to go, go through. Okay. If I lie down to sleep, I say, when will my day come? All right. Yeah. He's restless. He's not happy. He's not in his uh, regular element, okay, of relaxation and rest. He There are demands made on him. There are strong demands made on him. So that's always on his mind. And we think of ourselves with that when we have something that is really important, something that is troubling us or bothering us. What happens? Do we sleep well? Probably not. You know, And that's what he's saying here. He has all of these troubles. And so he doesn't have rest like the average person. You know, he doesn't have relaxation because all of this is on his mind. And what's on his mind? What's on his mind is the debate he's having with his friends. He's saying, I did not sin. I've examined my conscience left and right, up and down. I don't see it. And his friends are saying, eh, but, you know, something there. This doesn't happen to the average person. You see, So he has this on his mind all the time. This is eating at him, so to speak, as to what's the deal here. I don't understand why this happened. And when you look at what has happened here, he's lost his children. He's lost his cattle. Now, keep in mind, wealth in the Old Testament was not money necessarily, although he had a lot of money. Uh, wealth was cattle and land. That was your wealth. You see, so the more cattle you had, the wealthier you were. You were. As a matter of fact, you, uh, uh, when I talked about this, uh, when I talked about people who have wealth, I always say to those people who think having wealth is sinful, go back to the Bible. Abraham and Job were the wealthiest men in the Bible. And what did God do? He gave them more wealth. So that's not an issue. The issue is, what did you do with it? So when you read about Abraham, what did he do? He shared his cattle. He shared, you know, and, and Job was the same way. When you read about the whole book of Job, you see he's a very righteous man. And he's sharing all the good things the Lord has given him with other people. You see, that's the righteous life. And that's what he's saying. He sat, he's sitting there saying, but I do all this. Anybody who's ever needed anything comes to me and I take care of it. So I, this doesn't make any sense, right? This doesn't make any sense. So we jump now into six and seven. Six says, my days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle. They come to an end without hope. What is he saying here? Everybody has a lifespan. Job's lifespan and work, as he's viewing it right now, the lens he's looking through right now, are full of misery. That's what he's, my lifespan is like, that's it. You know, there's, there's nothing happy here, you see. And then he goes on to say, Remember that my life is like the wind. My eye will not see happiness again. In other words, I will not see prosperity again. I had it. It's all been taken from me. I won't see it. I won't experience it again. He's laying out. He's preparing himself. That's it. Life is done for me. I'm finished. Now, unfortunately, the readings today don't go further. Because when we go further in the readings here, then we see the conversation with God. Right. Then we see this whole story starts to come together. We see the conversation with God and how he um, he uh, his relationship with God is strengthened. So we see that ray of hope. But for whatever reason, uh, the church has selected only this particular portion of Job for us to read today. So it focuses on 
uh, his difficulty, his misery, he sees no hope at all. You know, everything in front of him is dark. Uh, and, and again, it's part of the fact that um, uh, he has examined his conscience. He doesn't see it. To fully understand it, as I said, you have to, um, you, to fully understand it, you have to read the dialogue with the friends. You know, the friends are coming and they're trying to be really nice to him, but they're saying, I hate to tell you this, Joe, but you did this yourself. That's the conversation that's going on here. So any com any questions with this? Any com okay, so I said Job is a challenge of a read. So if you choose to read the whole book of Job, which I always say, yeah, go ahead. I, I think you should. Um, but do it slowly. Don't just blow through it. Do it slowly. Understand there's dialogues going on and understand the position that Job is in and also understand that he's being tested. That's the key here. There's a test going on. See, now as the Satan rolls forward, he becomes Satan. He becomes the Satan that we know today. He's no longer the adversary. Now he's the stealer of souls from self. You see, once he gets tossed out of heaven, now he becomes pure evil. You see, so he's not just testing and saying to God, well, I don't know, you know, let, let, let's see if the let's see if they're really righteous. Let's see if they're really, you know. If they're faithful to you, no, that changes now. Once he gets thrown out of heaven, he becomes the character, you know, the evil, very, very evil character that uh, we know today and define today. So to Angela's point there, there's a case where, the, again, the, the meaning of the name has changed over time, you see. So he's the Satan, the member of the royal court in the very beginning, and his job is to go out and test to see if we're really, if what we say is right, are we really, you know, are we, are we, are we, you know, a good follower of God? You know, do, do, are we, do we have a good relationship with God? He's out to test us to see, do we or don't we? However, once he rejects God's plan and is thrown out, he becomes pure evil as we understand him today. Okay. Angela, yeah. So I just want to make sure I understand you correctly is that transition from tester to stealer of souls, that happens in Job, the end of Job? Or did I- No, it happens going on forward because it happens with the great battle in heaven is where this happens. So it's later on, you know, while he's in the Job situation and even going forward, he's still fine. What happens is when God, okay. uh, when he rejects God's plan of salvation, he and a band of his own angels, okay, uh, keep in mind, he's an angel. You know, so he uh, he and his band of of angels reject God's plan, and we have this great battle in heaven where Michael, the archangel, okay, wins the wins the battle. And they are defeated, and they are thrown out. They are cursed and thrown out. You know, so they rejected God's plan. So they have chosen hell for themselves, and so now they hate God with so much hatred now that what they want to do is go out and steal souls from god separate souls from god that's his role today and scripture says that as well you know that the, the lion prowling in the night looking for souls to devour that's what that means looking to find people who are weak and to pull them from their relationship with god that's his role today and it's uh, this, wow i said so that's that's profound i did not realize that that's how satan started out um because i just recently learned in my studies that at least one pastor's interpretation was a test is something that God uses to reveal our character and to show us who we really are. And I thought, wow, that's a great definition of a test um, because some people misunderstand that, like what a test is and when God tests us, mm -hmm. they think he's just messing around with us and he's just, you know, being mean and difficult or whatever, but tests are in fact the way to truth of who you really are where your heart lies it's, it's true what we have to realize is that god is love he can't hate he doesn't throw temptations at us no what happens here you have to go back into the uh into genesis and, and, and see what happened here in genesis original sin came into the world when original sin came into the world all of the difficulties that we have in the world sickness death trials and tribulations, that's all brought in by original sin. 
Now, also, original sin brings in, let's say, a smorgasbord of ways to turn away from God. Okay? What does God do? God gives us uh, free will. He doesn't give us evil. He gives us free will. He doesn't interfere what comes into the world, but he gives us free will to make those choices. There's your test, you see. So when that's the smorgasbord of whatever is put out to us, what do we take off of it? You see, do we remain faithful or do we take off of it something that steers us in another direction from God? Because <clears throat> God is love. That's, that's what he is. God creates and he loves. That, that's it. If people, anyone asks me like, well, what does he do? You know, does he have a day off? No, no, no. He creates and he loves. That's what he does. You see. But these other things, Satan brought into the world. The evil one brought these into the world with original sin. And so that's the challenge for us is to stay on the straight and narrow. Now, if you flip this into the New Testament, you see that Jesus understood, understood what we call the human condition. So he knows we're challenged with this all the time. So what does he give us? He gives us the sacrament of reconciliation. He knows we're going to stumble and fall. And so he gives us on Easter night in the upper room, he gives us that sacrament and says, I know you're going to stumble. Okay, that's fine. You know, here, there's a way to mend that relationship, right? There's a way to come back. There's a way to, to you know, to express sorrow for your sins. And he gives that sacrament on Easter night. And that's, that's, that's another one that... Um, uh, actually, our non-Catholic brothers and sisters uh, will hit me with, why do I have to go to confession, you know, to a priest when I can just tell my sins to God? Well, that's part of scripture that they're not paying attention to, because Jesus gave that authority to his apostles and their successors, you see, because he understood the human condition. You see? So that takes God out of the loop of saying, you know, God looks at his computer screen today and says, eh, I'm going to give Deacon Dan a hard time. That's not the way it works. That's not the way it works. So, so the tests that are thrown uh, at us today are tests that are out there because original sin is in the world. And so we have all of these difficulties there. And so the key thing for us then is to work on our prayer life, work on our spirituality, continue to build our relationship with God at whatever level it's at, you know, um, but continue to build that. And should we stumble, you know, should we, um, you know, hit our toe, uh, that's fine. Jesus has given us the sacrament of reconciliation to come back to him, to mend that. You see? So that's, that's the setup that you have today. Okay? And that comes into play. He gives that sacrament Easter night when he goes to the upper room. Okay. Now he doesn't say like the Testament, if you've done this sin, they have to, you get stoned. Okay. Or you know, or you get this sin. No, that goes away. That 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 goes away. That's the old testament, and that that was the law. If you did a certain thing and it was serious enough, well, you got stoned, or this it was a severe, severe punishment. Well, Jesus doesn't say, oh, by the way, you continue stoning them. As a matter of fact, the example we have is the adulterous woman. And what does Jesus say? Any, anyone who's free from sin, throw the first stone. He doesn't say it's okay to do it. He says, throw the first stone. Because he knows the human condition. And he knows that there is nobody that is free from sin. Except his mother. Okay, There's nobody free from sin. You see, Everybody crosses over there. And so he gives us a way to mend that relationship. Okay. Any other questions on that? That's important for us to understand because there's a lot of confusion about that. There's a lot of confusion about the sacrament, but it's important for us to understand that because um, that gives us hope. That's our hope, that no matter what happens, no matter how we stumble, no matter what difficulty in life that we have, Jesus gave us hope. He, gave, you know, he, he never cut the tie. You know, you know, even though he ascended to heaven, he never cut the tie. He's still here with us. But the free will is the key there. That's the key. We have free will. And with that free will on our heart, 
Scripture says, I will place the law on their heart. That's your conscience. So when you got that little guy on your shoulder saying, I don't think you should do that, you got to listen to it. You know, you have to, have to listen to it. And we talk about a well-formed conscience. When we talk about the faith, a well-formed conscience. And so we need to uh, look at various spiritual ways to continue to properly form our conscience and then spread that news on to others, you know, as to how to, those of you who are teachers, yeah, you got to spread that news on to others. Well, what, what is a properly formed conscience? And so as the, as the youth go into adulthood, they're on the, they're on the right path as to understanding right from wrong. And they begin to question their actions to make sure that their relationship with God is not going to be broken. But if it is broken, don't despair. Don't despair, because Jesus has given us a way to mend it. Okay? Anybody else there? Right, questions or comments? Yeah, Becky. I think readings like this are difficult to understand when people like me don't usually know what happened before the reading and after the reading. Um, if I just go to church and hear this today, it's like, wow, that is really depressing. That's the only word I can think of for that. But it's too bad there can't be a little sidebar. And I guess that's what you do in your homily is explain it further that our life isn't hopeless and we can have happiness because reading this is just like, you know, you just, if you were depressed anyway, you'd, you'd want to just give up. You know, that's true. I call these the bad hair day scriptures. And it just <laughs> so happens that I am preaching this weekend and I, I am preaching into the gospel uh, as I usually do into the New Testament. But when I look at the days that my preaching weekend and I open it up and it's something like this. Yeah, it takes me. <laughs> I sit there and say, OK, what do I do with this now? You know, don't go up and tell everybody, hey, look, life is uh, life's in the sewer. <laughs> you know, so, you know, suck it up and go forward. No, you have to look at this, and that's why you're, especially Job, it, 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 it takes explanation because you have to know what's going on beforehand because you're right, Becky, you just lift this out, and it's like, wow, what a bust. I'm not going to see happiness again. Gee, what a drag this is, you see? So you do have to unpack that, as we would say, and explain that, uh, and we explain that actually through the actions of Jesus is how we explain that, because that's where the hope and the good news and whatnot comes. But it is true. Sometimes our gospels are, or our readings rather, are very difficult. Or when Jesus is um, having a bad hair day and he's screaming at the Pharisees and it's your day to preach, you know, and do, you, do, you, do you get up and scream at the people? Or, you know, what do you do with this? You have to unpack it and, and get the people to understand what was going on and why, the, why he's putting a correction in place. And those of you, Deacon Dan is the only deacon I see here today, but I, I think you, you would share the same thoughts that I have, that when you open the scripture sometimes, it's like, okay, I got to take a deep breath with this. I got to find out what's going on, because it, sometimes Jesus sounds like a madman. He's, you know, you vipers, you brood of vipers. Like, okay, fine. Obviously, he's not having a good day. And so you have to find out what's going on before you can go forward with it. So, um in these readings, and we've had this happen the past couple of times, I've said to you, read before, read a few verses before, and read some verses after, so you can see what's happening here, because this has just been lifted out, and we need to understand why he is of this particular mindset, and what has happened, and what's happening. But then again, um, if I was preaching on Job, if I was preaching Job to this today, uh, I would remind the people that if they go to the next few verses, they see Job conversing with God very freely and very comfortably, you know, and building that relationship back with God. And then the end of the story is that Job is made whole. I believe he's given seven times, if I'm not mistaken, I think he's given seven times what he had before, you see. So he's mended that relationship and, um, and he's made whole by God. That's the part, unfortunately, that's left out today because we just see, go, we see Job really in, a, in a, a really a pit of despair with this so it's it's important to um if you understand and you if you keep in the back of your mind god is love every difficult part of sacred scripture that you read you will find as you work your way through it you will always find the ray of hope because he's there 
because he's there. But sometimes when they take these little snippets of scripture, it doesn't look like that to us. But even the Old Testament, I get that all the time. And I think I said this last week or a few weeks before that the Old Testament, people think that's the angry God. And the New Testament, he takes this Dale Carnegie course and everything's right with the world. You know, No, it's the same God in the Old Testament. What he's doing is he's trying to get the Israelites to know who he is. And so he's doing these great things for them. It's they that don't understand what he's doing. You know, as I said, he parts the Red Sea and two days later, it's, yeah, okay, what else you got? You know, you know, I want to have more vegetables or I want to have more whatever. So no matter what he does, he's not going to please them. But what does he do? He always, he's always there. If you look at the Old Testament, even in their very difficult times, they're wandering in the desert for 40 years or whatever. He's always there. He gives them food. He gives them meat when they want meat. He gives them water. No matter what they cry out for, he's there. You know, but again, as I said, the Old Testament has this really tough, tough, it's like a tough, tough God. But what's happening is they are breaking the relationship. They're breaking the covenant, which uh, saddens God tremendously. And he chastises them every time they do it. But what does he do? He initiates a new covenant and brings it. To, he never he doesn't he never says that's it. You've done this four times. I'm not coming back. You're out of here. No. What does he do? There's a new covenant in place. See, so he he chastises them a bit, but then never really never breaks the relationship. He mends the relationship all through it. And then Jesus is the new covenant, the final covenant. That's it. You say when he comes on the scene. And what he's doing is he's explaining to them what the law of Moses was saying. And that's why when he uh, preaches or when he talks, uh, he says, You have heard it said. A, B, C, D. But I say to you, he's correcting at that point, you say. That's what gets him into trouble because he talks as God, as one sent from God. And they're like scratching their heads, saying like, well, you know, where is this coming from? You know, But he's correct what they've done. So he's telling the people, you've heard it said that you can't do this, 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 but I say. And the emphasis when we preach this or when we read it, it shouldn't be a flat I say to you. Put the emphasis on the I, but I say to you. I'm telling you, whatever you heard, throw it out. This is what this means. You see? And that's what he's doing throughout the New Testament. He's clarifying and correcting for the people so they understand correctly what God's message is, what God is revealing to them, okay? as opposed to whatever interpretation they picked up. Uh, the, uh, you figure we have 10 commandments, and if I'm not mistaken, I want to say in uh, in Moses's day, out of the Ten Commandments came like something like six hundred and fifty six laws or something like that. Out of Ten Commandments, so when Jesus comes on the scene, he says, "No, this is not this is not how God intended this to be," and he's working on giving them the proper revelation from God. Okay, any other questions on that at all? Everybody's cool. Okay. Let's took, let's take a look at Paul. He's writing to the Corinthians. The Corinthians are a challenge for him, as we've said before, in that um, it's a very, very uh, wealthy seaport. And so you have, he has his good days where they are, everybody's, you know, following the faith. And then he has his bad days where they're kind of off the rails a bit, you know. So part of his letter is is praise. Part of his letter is correctional, depending on, you know, what he's addressing at that particular time. When you get into chapter 14 of Corinthians, that's where you get into the um, speaking in tongues and all of that. And he's correcting. He's saying, ah, this is the, you, know, you, you guys have it wrong. This is how this works, you know. Or you get into the spiritual gifts, and he's explaining what they are because the Corinthians had a misunderstanding of what the spiritual gifts were. And so he's correcting. So part of his letter, as I said, is praise. Other parts are a correction, okay? So let's take a look at the first verse here, 16. Who wants to read that for us? Okay, go, go ahead, Ann. If I preach the gospel, there is no reason for me to boast, for it, an obligation has been imposed on me. And woe to me if I do not preach it. Okay. What do you think's going on here? Yeah, somebody's criticized him. <laughs> yeah, somebody's criticized him. Okay. What's the criticism on? 
to do with the Lord. I don't know. It's right in the right, right after the comma. Oh, that he is boasting, that he's... He's boasting, yeah. In yeah. other words, he's not even preening himself, you know, he's stroking his own feathers, you know, he thinks he's a great guy because yeah. he's, you know, he because he's preaching the gospel. So it, it tells us that he's probably or possibly getting attacked for what he's saying, okay? Um, and he explains it by, again, when you look at this sentence, if I preach the gospel, he's educated, if I pre it's not a reason for me to boast, and he gives them the explanation he's been given an obligation yeah. to preach the gospel now there's a corrective in that because if he's been given an obligation he's talking to the christians and so what is he saying to them he's saying that a christian has to do the same thing you see, and he has to spread the good news to everyone at all times. And the reason being is that we as Christians have to give everyone the chance to come closer to Christ. So we have an obligation as well. We have an obligation to spread the good news, spread the gospel. As a matter of fact, at the very end of Mass, what does the deacon or the priest do? He charges the people with something. Go. And he's saying, take what you got here outside. You see? It used to be prior to Vatican II, uh, it was in Latin, uh, the mass has ended, go in peace. Uh, not anymore. Go and proclaim the gospel of the Lord. You know, or, you know uh, we give a directive. So we're telling the people that, no, what you just uh, experienced, the worship you just experienced, is just not for you and those people who are in this church building. It must go outside. And that's what he's saying here, is that everyone has to have the chance to come closer to Christ. So as you receive the word, you have the same obligation to share it. Don't keep it to yourself. You see, it's the same with spiritual gifts. And I'll get into spiritual gifts in depth on the retreat. But the same with spiritual gifts. They're not given to you as your gift. They only activate when you give them away. You see, so the gospel, as Paul's teaching the people, he's giving them an education so they can take that out then to the streets and the villages and whatever and spread the good news. See, so he's not doing it for his own, you know, his own pride. You know, he's not looking for any special favors. No, he views it as when he views his um, conversion, all right, as an obligation. His conversion is an obligation. He must now take the good news of Jesus Christ and how to and preach it. And he says, and woe to me if I do not preach it. He said, woe to me if I keep it to myself and I don't preach it. He realizes it as a very serious responsibility, and he wants to convey that message again to the Corinthians. That it's not, no, it's not for you to keep to yourself. It's not for you to keep to your, you know, your little family circle and whatnot. No, there's a consequence to pay if you don't spread the good news. So let's take a look at 17, because he carries this thought forward here. Who wants to read 17 for us? Deacon Dan, go ahead. If I do so willingly, I have a recompense. But if unwillingly, then I have been entrusted with a stewardship. Okay. What does this sound like? If he does so willingly, he has a recompense. What does that mean? He has like rewards. I'm sorry. He has like amends for things and yeah. He, 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 yeah. He, he's rewarded if he does so well. Yeah, he does so willingly. This isn't a this isn't a burden for him. All right. He does so willingly. All right. So again, what he's saying here is if he does so willingly, in other words, if he sacrifices his own desires, all right, for the sake of others. He is going to be rewarded. 
Okay. If he doesn't compartmentalize things, and that was a big thing in the day, they labeled people. Well, they do it today too. They labeled people, they pigeonholed people. This is this, this is this. He doesn't do that. He says, no, no, this is for everybody. You see? Because if he did that, if he held it to himself, if he separated himself from others, be very selfish. So we look at the back end of that, that verse, and what is he saying here? I have been entrusted with a stewardship. With a stewardship. What does that mean? What does a steward do? Deacon Dan. They take care of something. So it's yeah. kind of like the deacons, the herald of the gospels, right? We're the protectors. That's, yeah, that's correct. And so he's a, if you if you take on a stewardship or you are a steward, you are taking on the responsibility of, okay, there was people that you are serving, see? So he's saying here that, you know, then I have been entrusted with the stewardship. So he has to become all things to all people in order to save all people. That's what I said before. He can't pigeonhole them. He can't say, oh, well, this group was here and this group was there and this group was there. No, no, no. He's been entrusted with the stewardship. And the stewardship isn't just for this group of people or that group of people. The stewardship is for everybody because he fully understands Jesus died for everyone. Everyone. That's the key. He understands that. You see? So he's talking about doing it willingly. So that gives you an idea that not only is he teaching the good news, but he's teaching the virtue or the righteousness of taking that good news then out. Okay? Taking it out. And he's, you know, his recompense is the, the reward he gets from God for spreading the good news. But if he does it unwillingly, that puts a negative cast you know, on, on his work. And so in 18, he says, so what then is my recompense? That when I preach, I offer the gospel free of charge so as not to make full use of my right of the gospel. So what he's saying, no, you know, the gospel, he's preaching the gospel without charging everyone. He's not a speaker for hire. You see? And he's saying that he could have rightfully asked for some sort of compensation for but he doesn't he doesn't you see so he's thinking you know he's looking at the whole picture here you see and but and we do have a struggle with some some of again of the words again um if i did this if in other words if i preach the gospel by my own free choice he's saying i should deserve a reward but I don't have a choice about preaching the gospel. I'm carrying out a commission that's been entrusted to me. And I don't deserve credit for this. See? And part of that conversation, if you got deeper into the Corinthians, I mean, Paul was always being accused of, you know, wanting money or taking money or whatever. And further on in his writings, he talks about the fact that he's a tent maker. He never asked them for as much as a bean. You know, he came on the scene and he took care of himself, you see. So again, they would be questioned, what do we owe you? you, know, do, do you what, what do we have to pay you, you see? Um, so he's saying that only if he preaches the gospel for nothing does he make full use of the power of ministry. Okay, Only if he does it for nothing. If he treats it as merchandise, that's 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 a big negative. You say if he preaches it for nothing, he makes full use of the power of this gift. And when he's talking about reward, understand this: he's not talking about a cash reward. He's talking about God's special approval. That's the reward for him. He's not saying I should be getting X amount of shekels for this coming into your town or doing whatever. No, his reward is God's special approval, and so that if he does this. At goodness of his heart then he's making full use of the mission work that he's been given or full use of the ministry however you whatever word you want to use there only then does it become of value 
He hasn't put, it's not like merchandise, somebody coming in and buying something, wanting to buy something. So you want to hear the gospel? Okay, fine. It's, you know, it's 10 shekels to come in and hear Paul talk. No, no, no. No, he gets the full, he gets the full use of the power of missionary by preaching the gospel for nothing because his reward is God's special approval. He doesn't need a reward from them. It's God's special approval. By the same token, as he preaches that, he's planting that seed for them. That if you go out and you preach the good news, your reward is God's special approval. You see? Your reward is God's special approval. So he's he wants them to go out. He wants the he wants the 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 word of God to spread to the ends of the earth. That's where he's coming from with this. And he's getting, he wants them to understand that it is the it is the uh, approval of God that they're seeking, not any monetary gain or somebody giving you, doing a favor for you. And as I said, it's not in this reading, but in other readings, he says point blank, he, 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 has, a, uh, he has a profession, he's a tent maker. You know, he has a profession. So, you know, he's, when he's in these, when he's in Corinth, for example, He's preaching and teaching and whatnot, but also he's uh, he's uh, taking care of himself and his own needs. Now, it's not to say that people didn't invite him for dinner or whatever. We can assume they do. But he's letting them know that, no, he's not coming into your town and doing this because he wants you to open up your wallet and pay him for it. That's not the case. You see, so it's a two-edged sword there. He's explaining why he's doing it, but... He's also saying, follow my example. Follow my example. As you receive the good news, take the good news out, and your reward is from God. Any questions or comments on that? Okay, let's see. Who wants to read 19, and then it jumps to 22 and 23? You can then go ahead. Although I am free in regard to all, I have made myself a slave to all so as to win over as many as possible. To the weak, I became weak to win over the weak. I have become all things to all to save at least some. All this I do for the sake of the gospel so that I too may have a share in it. Okay. A lot going on here. What do we see? We see that word slave again. Okay. So how do we see how do, how do we see this? How do, what's applying here? I think he's showing on uh, 19 his complete uh dedication, I guess is a, a one word to the people and to the pronouncing the gospel and, and to them, right? To serving them. That he's yep. not doing this in a sense of slave as you're holding me, slave is in service, right? He's in service, yeah, slave is in service. And you see at the end there, to win over as many as possible. So that gives you an idea that he's got some critics there. He doesn't say, I'm going to win you all over. He realizes he has a mixed bag. He's trying to win over as many as possible. So that gives us an idea that in this writing to the Corinthians, he recognizes that there's a struggle here. There are some people that are saying, thanks for coming, you know, see you later. And there are others that are coming into the fold, so to speak. But that gives us an idea. What he's done, he's saying, I'm free. You know, I'm, I'm a free man. I'm not a servant to anybody, but I made myself a servant to everybody. Right? Because I want to win over as many people as possible to the good news. So he lets them, know, lets them know right up front, he's not um, uh, tied to anybody, okay? Nobody owns him. He's a free man, but he's making himself a servant to the people to serve them and win them over for Christ. But right in that line, we get, we, we get the idea that he's got some critics in the crowd, right? Because he doesn't say, I'm going to win everybody he says as many as possible so he's going to he does what jesus does okay he comes down to their level that's what he means i'm going to come to your level because i want to win as many as i can 
Deacon Dan. Even when you take the word slave, and I know we talked about the context of it, but like the 1861, the 1865, you know, Civil War times, even if you put it in that context, I made myself a slave to all. I mean, really, nobody would put themselves in that context in the 1800s. They wouldn't have turned themselves over to say, hey, my body is yours. Everything I have is yours. When you even take it to that context, to this reading, I mean, this guy's literally saying, everything I have, who I am, I'm giving to you. I don't even own myself. God owns me. I'm dumping everything for you, for your safety and your sake. I mean, really, servant or that context, it really is a powerful statement, really, what he's saying there to these people. Yes, because he could go on with his own trade. Remember, you know, when I say he made tents, he didn't work for Land's End or L.L. Bean, okay? These are huge tents, okay? Huge, huge tents. So he had a good business going. He had a very, very good business going. So that's, a, to your point, Deacon Dan, it's exactly right. You know, he's a free man. He can go off and do that and leave me alone. But no, he has embraced the good news so much, you see, that he wants to, to share this news. And that's why in 22, to the weak, I became weak. And this is what I was about to say. He brings himself down, okay, to the level of whoever it is he is um, preaching to or is spreading the good news, you see. He became weak to win over the weak. I become all things to all to save at least some. So what is he saying is, I'm plugging myself into whatever level of lifestyle you are at. Because my goal, my mission, my ministry is to win you over. But keep in mind, he puts at least some. And, and this is important because we read Paul sometimes too fast. And you think that he shows up in these towns and everybody's loving him. Hey, this is a great guy. This is Paul, blah, blah, blah. I'm teaching him, as a matter of fact, on Tuesday is the last class of the, uh, the Paul class uh, that I'm teaching. But when we really read what happened to him, he's stoned, he's whipped, he's put in jail. You know, so he, he, he's got a, a problem out there with the people. Not everybody is on the same page. So what he's saying here is he became weak uh, to the weak, I became weak to win over the weak. I've become all things to all. He's plugged himself in to whatever the lifestyle is going on in Corinth so that they can understand the good news at their level. Now, I'm going to take a, a leap here, okay? This reminds me of Benedictine spirituality. As Benedictines, we understand spirituality to be, to be on multiple levels. For example, my spirituality is not on the same level as Deacon Dan's, okay, or Becky's, or Anne's, or Angela's, you know, Ashfax. It's different. And St. Benedict says, you know what? That's fine. That's fine. We're not all on the same level, see? And I wonder if Benedict took that from here and said, you know, we have all these different levels, you know. So we can't have a guy go in there who is, let's say, super spiritual, and maybe there are people that are just learning, like neophytes, and now we're going to make them feel guilty because that they're not up here? And he says, no, that's not where it's at. It's perfectly fine for everybody. This isn't a cookie cutter. It's perfectly fine for everybody to be at all these different levels and then learn. And I think that that's what Paul is saying here. I became all things to all to let you know that whatever level you're at is fine. It's a starting point, And then we grow from there. But not everybody is at the same level. And I think that's really a beautiful, in spirituality, I think that's really a beautiful, not just thought, it's a beautiful concept, is that no one should feel um, uh, less of themselves because they are not holier than somebody else who they perceive to be holy. That's not where it's at, you see. It's your, wherever you are in your spirituality, that's where you start, and then you grow from there with different devotional practices or your prayer schedule or whoever that is. But it's it's improper to say that um, someone who isn't at a certain level is not spiritual. Benedict says, yeah, they are. They have different levels of spirituality, and we have to recognize that, you see. And 
again, if you go into Benedictine uh, history, when he was uh, a young man living in a cave, and uh, these uh, monks, I would call them monks, uh, came and they begged him to be their abbot. And he said, eh, I don't think that's going to work, guys. Why? His spirituality is here and they're here somewhere. Okay. He says, eh, I don't think this is going to work. So he becomes their abbot. And I think, this is my own impression from what I've read on, on, on him, is that he stayed here. No one else was coming. You know, they're there, they're here. So what did they do? They try to kill them. Not once, but a few times. You know, they poison his wine. That's why if you see a statue of St. Benedict, you'll see a cup with a snake in it and it's cracked, okay? When he blessed the wine, the cup cracked, so he didn't drink it. You'll also see a raven. They served him poisoned bread. So when he went to break the bread, a raven flew in and took the bread, all right? So then he... Packs his bags, okay, and he goes off. He now he founded twelve monasteries, but when you read his rule today, he calls his rule, which is a very beautiful uh, way of putting it. He says, "This is a rule for beginners." So he tells you right up front, he doesn't have this going on. It's beginners, right? So come in at whatever level you want. That's what Paul is saying here. He's become. He's trying to understand the the uh, the class structure or the levels of people, you know, throughout Corinth, so that he can plug into them and let them grow in the good news as they can. All right. So again, that's a beautiful thought for us as as well. You see, and in twenty three he says, "All this I do for the sake of the gospel." Why? so that I too may have a share in it. He does this for the sake of spreading the good news. So he's putting aside any thoughts of his critics at Corinth, and he's taking a wider, he's painting with a wider brush, you see. And um, again, he's, um, his role here is he wants to share in it. This is a sharing. This is a sharing. He wants to share in this. So he's also saying, I am not coming on the, on the scene with some magic wand. Okay? That's not why I'm here. I've come on the scene to spread the good news so we can all share in this. And again, it's important to understand that when um, he comes on the scene, okay, uh, when he comes on the scene, uh, he looks at he cover he takes a quick look at what he's got to to work with, and he sees the joy of the sharing of where we are at spiritually. How do we have that today? We have it today when we break up into our little Bible study groups or our prayer groups or whatever else we're going on or a scripture reading group. What are we doing? We're sharing. We're doing exactly what Paul did. He stepped in, he plugged in, and they shared, you see, so that he may too have a he may that he too may have a share in the joy of the good news. That's his key. That's his key. So he's not out there saying, I'm telling you to do this, and you do this, and you do this. No, that's not the case. He wants to share in the good news. He wants to share in the excitement. He wants to be filled with joy as he sees the light bulb go off. To the people who are all of a sudden grasping the good news, he wants to share in that. He becomes one of them. He becomes one of them. Any questions or comments that? You can, Dan, go ahead. I just think that, you know, the more I jumped into these readings and theology of the church, I think that's one of the most powerful points that sometimes gets lost is that we're all sharers in this faith, you know, whether you're a deacon, a priest, or a bishop. It's all equal. Really, it truly is. Like, we all have an obligation, like you said in the beginning, we're all called to do it. You know, St. Paul's just reminding them that, you know, we all have an equal share in this thing, right? <laughs> Our share is, you know it, you teach it, you spread it, you help those that are weak and the poor. And, you know, some of us, you yeah, have a different calling to approach it in a different manner, right? Like the spiritual gifts, we all have, and we've talked about it numerous times, different way of approaching this sharing, 
But it's just a huge thing to understand that it is important that we all find out what is God's calling for us to share. Yeah, because he's the one that comes up with this body of Christ description. Now, when I teach this or I preach about this, to me, the body of Christ is like a jigsaw puzzle. Each and every one of us has different gifts from God. And when we start to put the puzzle together, then we have this beautiful picture of God's will for us and the church. And so the church cannot survive not being the body of Christ or not being this puzzle because he intentionally gave each and every one of us gifts to use for doing what? For building up the body of Christ. You see, so as the puzzle pieces come together, we see all of that. Now, what are the puzzle pieces? Again, they're the spiritual gifts, the different ministries in the church, the different ways we reach out. And as we start to put this puzzle together, we begin to see what God's plan was. What did he want? He wanted a church that was caring. He wanted Jesus. Jesus founded a church that was caring. He founded a church that was um, uh, going to equip people to care for each other. You see, so it's an equipping church. It's an educating church. It's a spiritual church. All of these are the different puzzle parts. And each one of us has a, whatever God has given us in spiritual gifts that plugs into that. So as we begin to put those pieces together, we see where it all fits. But all of a sudden we have this, you know, as I said, it's not a cookie cutter. It's not a cookie cutter. Now, some of us can have the same or similar gifts of others, but chances are no. Everybody has different gifts and that's on purpose that is that is you know, on, it's part of god's plan and that's what paul is trying to convey here that even though he has these gifts he's plugging himself in to the weak wherever you are he's plugging himself in but he's not he's not coming on the scene saying hey you know i'm the great preacher and i'm doing whatever no 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 he's coming in he's assessing the situation and he's plugging himself into whomever it is that he is preaching and teaching to, you see. And he wants them to know that he's on the same, he's with them, he's on the same plane. That's why he says, to the weak, I become weak, right? In other words, to those who don't know, to those who don't understand, I'm I'm with you, I'm right there. And we're gonna, we're gonna hold hands and we're gonna walk on this journey together. And that's a beautiful visual, a beautiful image. We're all on a journey together. So we all need to grab hands and walk together. There's no way Christianity is not a spectator sport. You know, there's no, there's, the bleachers are empty. Everybody's on the field. That's where Paul's coming from. The bleachers are empty. You're all on the field. You're all playing in the game. Otherwise, it doesn't work because that's not God's plan. God didn't say, okay, Deacon Dan, you're fantastic. You're over here and only you stay with these people. Okay, and you're over here, you stay with these people. No, 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 you've got to stay with all of them. And, and in formation, as we teach the deacon candidates that no matter what degrees or level of education you have, you have to speak to the level of the people that are sitting in front of you. If you come in and you speak at a high theological level, no one's gonna, very few are gonna understand what you're talking about. So you have to, you have to know who your community is. That's what Paul is saying here. He has to know who his community is, and he has to address the community in a way that the community understands him and understands the word of God. That's the key. And that's the key for all of us. Because in this, in this reading today, he's giving the challenge to everybody. You see? He wants everybody to go out and do the same thing. So he's spreading the good news, but he's teaching how to spread the good news as well. And further on in the Corinthians, you'll see where he's kind of slaps him on the wrist and says, hey, you guys get, you know, you, you, and, and it gets into the spiritual gifts where some people felt that I have this gift, so I'm better than you. And he says, nice try, but no, spiritual gifts, they're all given, you know, to build up the body of Christ. And there's no one gift that's more important or bigger than the other. They're all the same. And that's why I like the image of a puzzle. We take our gifts and we begin to put this puzzle together. And then there we get to see what the body of Christ looks like give you a little again i've been here i've been to this house and um the synagogue is a stone's throw you can walk to it depending on how fast you walk probably two minutes three minutes it's right there which is typical of the day because you have to uh re remember the jewish law 
You could not work on the Sabbath. And so the only thing you were allowed to do was go to the synagogue and back to your home. So every town had a synagogue that was really close to the village because you couldn't, you know, couldn't be going going on a half a day trek to the synagogue. So I've been in this synagogue, which is really a powerful place to be. And I've been in Simon's house as well, which is kind of neat. So um, I wanted you to know that when, it, when they talk about the synagogue, on leaving the synagogue, he entered the house of Simon. It's right there. It's, it's, it's not far away, you know, so he leaves the synagogue and he goes over to the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. OK, now what's key here. Is that four names are mentioned. When that's very particular uh, or uh, rather peculiar for Mark the, the, that he does, he mentions these four, you see, uh, and um, what we're seeing here is we're starting to see the structure that comes into play here, you see. Um, James and John, Peter, James, and John are throughout sacred scripture, right? So they are uh, the pillars. I think Paul refers to them as the pillars, you know, of the church, you see. But um, the uh, the house being uh, Peter's house, all right, uh, ties an interesting thread with this, all right? Um, it's the important thing are the numbers. And again, these are the names of the witnesses that witness this miracle that's going to take place. You see? Peter, James, and John, as I said, they're always selected from the group. You see, so uh, these, they are witnesses. They are testimony to the different um, events in the life of Christ. You see? So, Andrew being present, all right, uh, that solidifies for us that is the Peter's family house, okay? That solidifies for us that it's Peter's family house. So that's the, uh, that's the entrance to this, okay? So let's take a look at 30. Who wants to read 30? Deacon Dan? Simon's mother-in-law lay sick with a fever. They immediately told him about her. Okay. What do you see here? Should be real obvious. Okay. Yeah, you <laughs> You failed that one, Deacon Dan. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. I'm thinking a little deep right now. Uh, the mother-in-law is sick with a fever, but they immediately go and tell him. <laughs> okay, yeah, okay, you're there. Close. Frank. Uh, I think they, they assume he's going to do something for her. There you go. There you go. He's done everything for everybody else. So they immediately, and I say, John, everything with, with Mark, rather, everything is quick, okay? But yeah, they figure, hey, we've been traveling the country. You know, he's been healing everyone that has crawled over a rock here. We're going to go to him and tell him immediately about her. Why? They have faith. He's going to do something. You see, they have faith, you see. Now, if you read this Luke, if you look at Luke's reference, he describes it as a physician would. She had a great fever, right? So he wants the he wants us to know that this wasn't just, ah, she wasn't feeling good today. You know, she's really sick, you see. So he distinguishes it from kind of a lighter sickness, you see, that in the day, again, as we're talking about language, um, in the day, if you had a fever, they wanted to know, did you have a small one or did you have a great one, you see? So they they so they well, Luke clarifies that nah, she's really sick, you see. So to Frank's point, they are hoping that his compassion will be shared on one of his own, you see. So they immediately told him about her. So he's aware of this. Okay. So let's look at 31. What do we see here? 
Lauren. He cures her. He, he grabs her hand and helps her up and she's fine. He grabs her hand. No, there's a connection. He grabs her hand. We've seen this before where the power comes out from him. Remember the woman with that touch the tassel? Okay, on his robe and what happened? You know, he felt the power, you know, and the 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 his the, the disciples are saying, come on, it's like 10,000 people here. What do you, you know, what, how would we know who touched it? And he says, no, I felt the power go out of me. He touches her so that the power will come out of him and go into her, you see. And he helps her up. And at that moment, at that moment, the fever left her. Now, there's something strange in this particular verse. What do you think it is? The fact that she waited on them immediately. Like, that was the first thing she did. She waited on them immediately. And it's like, you know, people read this and say, really? I mean, she crawls out of her sick bed and she's got to feed these people? Yeah, what's the deal here? You know, well, again, it's culture. You see, it's culture. First off, if there anyone, he approached, he advanced, he made the advance. He approached, you see, and he took her. You see, so what we see here is the beloved physician standing over her, assessing the situation. But now we have to look at what happens in, culturally. Culturally, when any visitors come, the women prepare food for them. They prepare food for them and they feed them. That's common. That's not natural and normal. When I was over there a few years ago, um, we were invited to uh, one of the shopkeepers' homes for dinner. This was a to die for dinner. It was the wife, his wife and his mother-in-law. They must have been cooking for days. Never saw, I didn't want to leave. I wanted to put the food in my bag and take it home. I mean, it, was, it was unbelievable, you know, but they were having guests come. And so they pulled out all the stops to provide food, good drink and whatnot. You know, it was a wonderful, wonderful evening. That's the culture, you see. So again, what did she do? Well, she's feeling well, you see. So she, to show her gratitude to, to Jesus, all right? Um, what does she do? She immediately goes into the role of the cultural role of serving them at the house of serving them. See, and so this is she's showing her gratitude, her gratefulness, you see, because Jesus is the doctor beyond compare. I mean, there's no question. He is the physician, the physician of physicians, you see. So in this situation, we see if we were reading Luke, who's a physician, Jesus is both the doctor and the cure, both the doctor and the cure. He doesn't say, you know, here's a bottle of aspirin, you know, take two and call me in the morning. You know, no, he's the doctor and the cure, you see. So to show her appreciation, her gratitude, her role would be that she, if she's feeling well, she's going to get up and serve them. And she does, and she does. now. There's no reference here, and I get this all the time, especially since this new program has come out, The Chosen. There is no reference to Peter's wife. We do not know who she is at all. We know he's married because he has a mother-in-law. But we don't know if she's even alive at this point. I have no idea. There's no Scripture gives us no information. Now, I know The Chosen has given her a name, and they built a little story around her. That's to, for them to, I guess, just stretch out the story. You know, in the in, in the movie, but yeah, because I got a lot of. I think they called her Edna. I, I think you know, I got a few phone calls on that, and it, she supposedly had a miscarriage. I said, well, we call that any any movie we call a TV show. We call a par we call it a paraphrastic view of the Bible. What that means is the um, the writers, the producers, they are given a little bit of latitude, all right? So they add some things, they tweak some things, you know, to make it a more interesting story. 
they stay as true to the scripture as they can, and they usually do, but they'll put in a couple, a little love story here and there or whatever. I watched the greatest story ever told, and uh, this was one where they really screwed up because scripture tells us that Judas hanged himself, and in that particular movie, he jumps into a pit of fire. I mean, that's like the most obvious, like, hey, guys, did you miss, miss a page here? Like, well, where, where'd you get this? Yeah. But we call that a paraphrastic view. A lot of that times that's used in children's Bible stories to make it understandable for them. Okay. And that's, the, and it's fine. You know, as long as it stays as true to scripture as possible, it's fine. You're certainly not going to go in depth uh, with young children on a forensic study of crucifixion not going to happen okay so what you do is, is you're given you're given latitude okay to put it into the context of something they would understand now, i get that all the time even the bishop asked me can your courses be taught taught to the kids and i said no they can't because you need that bridge you know i can't take them from where they are on their little bit of knowledge and all of a sudden leap them over here it doesn't gotta work you know, there has to be, so the teachers that are teaching them along in grammar school and high school, they have to take them along little by little. Then at some point, they're ready to come into a, a, a more in-depth. And even our our um, deacon candidates have said, after they've taken, the first course they get is mine on sacred scripture. And it's, you know, they all show up and after I say good evening, there's no, there's no color in their face. The blood drains from their face. And it's like, what is he talking about? You know why? Because we go to a certain depth, you see. And every student that I've had, or just about every student I've had, has, has said, why were we ever taught this before? Well, you're not taught at that level. That's why. It comes to a certain level. So then what we do is we take it and we, now I've opened up to the lay people because I get this all the time. Can we have more in-depth courses? And I say, yes, not a problem. So what I do is I then take that bridge and bring them into, you know, in, in, into a, a more in-depth. So, um, but anyway, getting back to this. So what we know is that um, Peter has um, a mother-in-law and the mother-in-law steps to the plate and she serves them, okay? And um, the rest of the story goes on. So... Any other questions on that, what we just talked about before we go on? I just would like to make a comment about how that sort of ties into St. Paul's um, sort of commentary on like responsibility, basically, because it's talking about his freedom, but on the other side of freedom is responsibility for mature people, anyhow. They don't mm -hmm. just use their freedom for their for themselves. And so she, what does she do the minute she is healed, given freedom from her illness? She serves Jesus. And that's such a beautiful, like, what are you going to do with your freedom? Basically, if anybody has freedom, you know, creative freedom, financial freedom, emotional freedom, that's probably a pretty good indication of what you need to be. That's one of your gifts. Mm -hmm. God gave you freedom in that. Mm -hmm. And you take responsibility for it, how you share it, you help others, you give to others. And I just love that the two readings were paired because it's all about how they're taking responsibility for yep. their faith. Good point. And what I, what I like about it is that Paul is making it clear that he meets everybody at their level. We need to realize that Peter is not a wealthy man. He's a fisherman. Okay. You have your good days, you have your bad days. What does his mother-in-law give Jesus? Herself. Just what Angela was saying, the freedom. What does she have to give? She has herself to give. And so she gets up, and that's the first thing. Her sign of gratitude is giving herself to Jesus for what he has done. So, so it's not like she, you know, threw a bag of money at him and said, here's this for your mission. No, she gives her, she immediately doesn't even give it a second thought. It doesn't say she waited a minute. It says she got up and she served him. So she gave of herself. That's what Paul is talking about as well. That in his, in that reading, what did he do? The whole reading, he gave of himself. 
he says point blank, I came down to the week, I came over here, I came over here. You know, he gave of himself to wherever he felt he could plug in, he gave of himself. And so this is exactly what she does. She gives of herself without you no, know, it doesn't say, you know, after an hour, you know, she you know put the pot on the stove, you know, she just got her, just went and did it. See, now what happens? Now keep in mind what I told you. This house is very, very small. And when you go to the Holy Land, there's a beautiful church built above it. So you can't walk into the house, but you can see it. And it's it's a what's left is a stone foundation. But it's very small. And that's that's the other side of the story. So let's take a look at when it was evening after sunset. Now, there's a key here. If they were in the synagogue, it was the Sabbath. OK, after sunset, the Sabbath is over. All right. Otherwise, this the rest of the story wouldn't have happened. It couldn't have because they couldn't come a distance. You see, they brought to him all who were ill or possessed by demons. So if it was the, the Sabbath, these people came from all over. They could not do that. You see, they had to go to the synagogue only. So he clarifies for us when it was evening. So nobody's breaking the law. OK, after sunset, nobody's breaking the law. They brought to him all who were ill or possessed by demons. OK. Now, as I said, it would have been unlawful for them to bring their sick during the Sabbath hours. So this happens afterwards. So they all waited. Okay, till so everything was over, and then they brought them. Now they brought them in crowds. So Jesus is now going to teach them by example, even at the risk of his own life. Okay, he's going to teach them by example. So now we look at thirty-three. What does thirty-three say to us? Go ahead. The whole town gathered at the door. The whole town. Everybody. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. The whole town gathered at the door. You see, the whole city comes together at the door. Now, the door is tight. This isn't, you know, this isn't a big revolving door where everybody can come in. This is a tiny entrance, you see. So, again, all the sick, all the people who brought the sick, and also the spectators, Never forget that in the crowds that follow Jesus, there are always spectators to see what's going on. You know, they're doing, you know, they want to really see if this is happening. You see, they want to see what sign he's going to do. You see, so again, well, we know that we know that there are in in that crowd. Then there are eyewitnesses. There are eyewitnesses, and we see that throughout the gospel. The way these other people are there, you know, if they're not being healed or they're not looking for something from Jesus, they're witnessing what's going on. They're witnessing what's and we would be the same way if we had word that some healer was coming into town and he had raised people from the dead. He gave people their hearing back, their eyesight back. I guess I think all of us would be in the crowd to see like, oh, what is this? I want to see this. Not that we might need something right then there, but. The curiosity gets the best of us. We wonder, does this really happen? You see, so this crowd comes in. Let's take a look at 34. Who wants to read 34? Deacon Dan, go ahead. He cured many who were sick with various diseases, and he drove out many demons, not permitting them to speak because they knew him. Mm. Okay. So what do we see here? Matthew, in Matthew's gospel, he says he cast out the spirits with his word, okay, or with a word, right? So he doesn't permit them to speak. Why is that? Who is it he permitting to speak? Is it the demons or the people he cured? Jesus would not permit the demons to speak. The demons, okay. Why not? He does want himself to be revealed. Okay, there you go. Okay. Is that where you're going, Deacon Dan? Same thing? Yeah. It's called, actually, in, in, in scriptural terms, this is called the hidden Messiah. Jesus wants his Messiahship hidden. 
He doesn't want it known because there are many, many false messiahs out there, okay? And he does not want to be confused with the false prophets or the false messiahs, you see? So if they were permitted to speak, they would reveal who he was, you see? So he silences them. That's it, you see? He silences them. It says that they're not permitted to speak. Okay. And that's a key point. That's a key point with him. He does that a few times. He just tells them to be quiet. Don't, you know, they're, 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 don't speak. All right. Can you talk about, I don't understand. I don't under, I still don't understand why Jesus did not permit them to speak. Can you, I know you just said it, but it didn't. In, 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 a, in a previous scripture, they say to him, we know you are Jesus, the Holy One of God. He doesn't want that known. And why? That's not in, that's not in this scripture, but he in another one, uh, they say to him the, the 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 when he drives the legions out, or, you know, we know you are the Holy One of God, and he says, "Quiet," you know, and he shuts that he shuts them up. You know, he doesn't want that out at all. But why? I've never understood well, that. In the day. There were many false messiahs who took advantage of the people, okay? And Jesus did not want to be confused with the false messiahs because he was the messiah. So he called himself the son of man, a very humble title. He would not call himself. As a matter of fact, when, um, when Peter reveals on the Mount of Transfiguration who he is, what does he say? Don't tell anybody. You can't tell anybody this. You know, you know it, but you know, don't tell anybody. Uh, he doesn't want it known because, uh, again, as you read further in Scripture, there are magicians. The word would be magus. There's a guy, Simon Magus, as a matter of fact, who's a magician who does all sorts of these healing tricks and whatnot. Jesus did not want to be confused with them at all, so he only addressed himself as the uh, the son of the son of man. Uh, now the um, the what do you call it? Uh, as I said at the Transfiguration, or um, when we have Peter's great confession, and it, Jesus says, do, when when they all want to leave him during the uh, the Bread of Life discourses, and they leave, and he turns to the disciples and says, "Do you want to leave too?" And what do they say to him? Where would we go? Where would we go? You're the only one. And he says, "My Father revealed this to you," but then he also says, "Don't tell anybody. Be quiet." So he's okay with people who are in relationship with him, acknowledging him for the truth of who he is. But for people who are not yet in relationship with him, he doesn't want to get labeled as some like cheap, yeah. cheap trick messiah, savior, or whatever. Wow, that's powerful. Okay, yeah. I get he it. He doesn't want to be. He doesn't want to be confused with some circus sideshow, which went off. As a matter of fact, Simon Magus actually went to Saint Peter. And offered to pay for the gifts to heal. <laughs> That's down the road, okay? That's down the road. That's in the book of Acts. You know, he actually went and said, you know, hey, I want these gifts. You know, how much do you want for these gifts? You know, no, that wasn't the case. You know, so Jesus kept it very clear. But to his to the to the disciples, you read it many times in scripture where he takes them aside to explain something to them, you see. So it is kind of a, a very tight knit secret society, so to speak, where Jesus is revealing to them what he just taught, and he does this with the the um, the uh, the throwing the seed on the ground and whatnot. It says right in Scripture. He then took them aside and explained what he was talking about. You see, so they understood this. Now they didn't totally understand it until the Holy Spirit comes, but he's constantly explaining to them. You see, and then with keep in mind on the on the Mount of Transfiguration, it's Peter, James, and John, and him. That's why I said that before. You have these three that are there, so they're the ones on the Mount of Transfiguration that see this and hear this. And he says, "Yeah, but don't tell anybody." Don't well, anybody. I, okay, so this, I okay, so does this speak to like? When you're in the company of people who don't believe in Jesus, who are not Trinitarians, mm -hmm. are we 
I get confused about this sometimes. Like, are we supposed to say that Jesus, is, you know, who Jesus is, or, or are we supposed to let them figure it out for themselves? Do you know what I'm like? Oh, I know what you mean. No, no. Yeah. That'd so maybe. Because... Go ahead. Because sometimes I struggle with, you know, not acknowledging Jesus in front of people and not acknowledging Jesus, but talking about the truth of who he is with people because I don't want to like feel like I'm shoving it down their throats. And I'm talking about if it comes up in conversation. Um, but then you also don't want to den deny Christ in front of people. So I've always sort of struggled with that. Um, but this sort of make this makes sense on a deeper and, level. And there's two things here in that Jesus is the only person, although there are many books out there that are written about the historical Jesus. He's the only person in ever that you can't write that way about. You cannot write about his, his the historic Jesus without identifying the divine Jesus. He's the only one. So again, yeah, no, we need to explain who he And we have scripture that says that. His baptism, okay? What happens? We have Jesus in the water. We have the dove, which represents the Holy Spirit above him. And we have the voice of the Father that says, this is my beloved son. There's his identity, the son of God, right out, okay? In the transfiguration what do we have we have moses we have elijah the voice of the father says this is my beloved son listen to him there's your active word listen to him he's telling you that you need to listen to the son of god so jesus's identity is that he is the son of god and if you go all the way back to genesis uh, people will say where do you find the, the trinity well, yeah, as we've, I've said this before, you don't find the word Trinity because it isn't there until the church fathers. But go back to Genesis and what do you have? There's a dialogue going on. God is saying, we, who's he talking to? He's talking to the word of God. Who's the word of God? Jesus. And who else is in the picture? This wind that's blowing over the abyss or whatever you want to call it depending on the translation so what do you have you have the father talking to the son and you have the holy spirit we don't call it trinity but the three of them are there right there and they're never separated but jesus i mean the word of god faith is all about putting it together yourself not yourself but engaging with it and paying attention and synthesizing the information and anybody paying attention to the bible anybody who's reading it faithfully you have to have a word for what god god is the trinity because jesus does tell us about the spirit jesus and i I've, I've just encountered people like this that say well the bible does, never doesn't use the word trinity it doesn't, doesn't have word, to. doesn't use the word bible either it's tell, very tell, good. tell them the word bible isn't in it either so boy where are we going that's great <laughs> you know that's not there either you know but again you know we uh, when we look at jesus you know, god is spirit he needs a voice when he speaks now in the old testament when he sends a messenger let's use you know, well let's use new testament he sends a messenger he needs to speak to mary he sends gabriel he has to have a voice and the word angel, angelos, means messenger. That's a messenger. And even in the Old Testament, the, he sends angels as his voice. Now, here's, a, here's, a, here's one for you. Moses goes to the burning bush. And I've said this to some of you already. And he talks to the burning bush. If God is spirit and Jesus is the word who speaks for him, who's he talking to? Jesus. Jesus, because Jesus is the word of God. He's the voice of God, you see. And that's why I say this, that you have to have that bridge. This is really deep theology, you see. Now, when you read the Bible, you can read the Bible for a variety of reasons. You read it for history. That's a different read. You read it for culture. That's a different read. When you read it to hear God talking to you, that's a different read. 
And that's the revelation of the Bible. God is going, and we will do this on our retreat. The last day of the retreat, we do, again, a very deep Lexio Divina, because I want the people to, to experience God revealing himself to them one-on-one. -on -one. You see? So depending on how you're reading sacred scripture, if you're in a Bible group and you're just sharing thoughts and ideas, that's one thing. But if you're really focusing in as we would do in Alexio Divina, you will hear a word from God that is only for you. So that's why I say there's various ways to read the Bible. So when someone says, I'm reading the Bible, I need to find out why. What are you, what are you doing? You want history? That's fine. You want the culture? That's fine. You, know, you want to hear God talking to you? You have to go into a completely different mindset to do that. So that's what's very important. And people just say, oh, I read the Bible. Well, that's fine. It's like reading Gone with the Wind. Yeah, I read that too. Yeah, great story. Great stories in there. Yeah, whoever this guy Jesus is, he's fantastic. But if I want to read it to have to, to see where God is revealing himself to me, that is a much deeper level and a personal level. Because at that point, God is not speaking to the mind. God is speaking to the heart. That's the difference. You read for culture, you read for history, God's speaking to the mind. That's what you're getting out of there. Okay. So there's a difference. There's a major difference. As I said, there's, I think Bill O'Reilly wrote a book uh, on, on Jesus, and it's a, the historical Jesus. Very nice book. But as I said, he's the one person in the universe that you can't do that about because he has these two. And we don't understand that. We don't understand the divine nature and the human nature. We don't, we won't understand that until we see him. But also, it's not like when he was with the disciples and the people, he left his divine hat up on the Mount of Olives, you know, and worked with them. And then when he went up to pray, he took an, and put his divine hat on. No, somehow he's both. He is, you know, he, he's, you know, human and divine. And in his human nature, the beauty of it for us is in his human nature, he experiences every single thing. He understands humanity. He understands the human condition, right? And so in his human nature, we have that, you know, um, uh, important, very important, okay, um, connect with him. He understands us. And then he has a divine nature, you know, well, he's God. He is God, you see. So, um, and that, when you get into, when you get into uh, to questions with non-Catholic, some non-Catholics or other denominations or whatever they are, some don't recognize Jesus as God. He's a nice person. You know, he's a prophet. He's a nice person. Some say that Jesus received his divinity when he died on the cross. No, no, no. He always had it. He always had it. He didn't receive it like God, like the God the Father said, okay, you've done enough now. Here's your reward. You know, here's your here's your scout badge. You know, put it on your toga. You know, you're cool. You're, you've done. No, 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 no. He always had that. He will, and that's why he steps away to talk to the disciples many times to explain to them what it is he just said, okay? And then the other beauty of it is, I love it when it says he went off by himself to pray, okay? There's your Lexio Divina for us. What is he doing? He's going off to connect with the Father to see what message the Father has for him. You see, and so yeah, just like us, at the end of the day, he says, "Enough is enough. I'm disappearing," you know, and he goes off by himself to pray. Okay, now we got a little off topic there, but um, uh, I think it's important that since Angela brought that up, that we talk about that because this is we have to know who he is, and we can't dumb him down. Can't dumb him down to some figure who wanders through the weeds talking to people. That's not the no, That's not who he is. That's not who he is. Jesus is an, a man of action. And wherever he goes, action happens. Wherever he goes, and it's positive action. Wherever he goes, action happens. Why? He has a mission to do. He has a mission to do. You know, he, even when, you know, the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the apostles are looking for him, Okay, well, we're going to get into that. Let's go further. We'll get into that and explain that. So, again, um, so rising, yeah, rising very early before dawn, 
he left and went off to a deserted place where he prayed. And I encourage all of us to do that. My deserted place is St. Vincent. Nancy knows that when I need to get away, I go and I disappear for a couple of days at St. Vincent. That's it. Nobody bothers me there. I get a room in the monastery because I'm clergy. And if I want to have somebody speak with me and meet with me, they'll do it. If not, that's it. I'm off by myself, you know, to commune with God, you see. So in other words, so very early before dawn, after this remarkable Sabbath, with all these people coming to Peter's house, right? He's choosing this day to inaugurate a new stage of his public work. You know, he went out, okay? He went out from Peter's house, got up from where he slept, and out he goes. Right? And he goes to this deserted place. And there he prayed. Or you could say he continued in prayer. Because when he healed the people, what does he do? He prays. He gives thanks, all right, and he heals. So we could say that he went off to continue in prayer, but to continue in prayer by himself. Why? Well, now look what's happened. What's going to happen after this? He's going to go out and spend time, all right, on his preaching and healing circuit. In other words, he's going on the road, all right? He's going on the road. So he's going to plug in. You see, as he did on many occasions. So he spends time in special prayer. Special prayer. See? So, I mean, what wouldn't any of us give to just have that stillness? I'm sure we've all gone through this, like enough is enough. You know, I don't want to hear the phone. I don't want to get an email. You know, we want that stillness, even if it's only for five minutes. He wants that stillness, you see. And so with that stillness, he's able to pull back everything that has happened, which you need to understand it's dramatic. Thousands, it could be thousands of people came to Peter's house. He needs to pull back. He needs to, you know, to, to um, catch his breath, so to speak. You see? So, because um, he barely arrives at a place and there's crowds. We see that all through the scripture. He barely arrives at a place and there's crowds for him. You see? So again, what does he want to do? He wants to have his soul join with the word of the Father. Okay, we call it the beatific vision. Okay, his soul is about to go into, theologically, I have a note here that says, his soul goes into the bosom of him who sent him. He wants to be pulled right in to the bosom of the Father, because that's what he's used to. We saw it in Genesis. They're talking in Genesis, and then he come, He leaves and comes down, you see. Now, there's no doubt, though, that he enjoys the time with his um, disciples and the people. There's no doubt. I don't want to make it seem like, you know, he looks up and says, oh, no, another crowd of people. No, no, no. This is his mission, which he fully accepts, and he gets great enjoyment of that. Okay. But now, everyone's hunting for him. He's disappeared. Where is he? Where, you know, where is he? You see? So, you know, Peter gets up and everybody's looking for him. Okay. So Peter, we assume here, um, because of the next verse that says, Simon and those who were with him pursued him. So he gets together a search party, for lack of another word. Okay. Everybody's wondering where he went. Okay. One of the translations says that they pressed after him. They wanted to find him. Multitudes sought after him. Okay. And this, this group would be from the town. You know, keep in mind, Mark is getting his information directly from Peter. It is believed that Mark is Peter's secretary, so to speak. It's a scribe, you see. So he speaks of only what was related directly to him. So in other words, these people were with him. All right. And again, James, John, James, John, and Andrew. Okay. Look at 37. What does he say in 37? Everybody's looking for you. <laughs> Everybody's looking for you. Tells us that all of these people stayed there. No one left. Why? 
they had more to ask him. They had more things for him to do, you see. So they search for him. Oh, everybody. So again, multitudes, crowds. Luke, Luke says multitudes sought after, sought after him. So we gather there's a lot of people. Okay. So he says to them, 38, he told them, let's go on to the nearby villages that I may preach there also. And then he clarifies why. This is the purpose I uh, have I come. Okay. So another translation says, let's go elsewhere. That's the point he's making. Okay, we did our job here. Come on, let's move on. Let's go elsewhere, you see. So, or, or let's go into the next towns, you see. The neighboring village towns. Now, keep in mind, they're all pretty close, you know, but let's go into them, you see. And what he's saying is, let's go into these places that need this ministry. So he's on the western side, excuse me, of the Sea of Galilee. And he wants to preach there. He's saying now when he goes to the western side, it's not from Capernaum. That's where he is. That's where Capernaum, you know. Um, he comes forth from the Father. John tells us he's come forth from the Father, okay, and he came into the world. So he understands his mission, and he doesn't have much time. You see, he doesn't have much time. So what he's saying to them is, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities. Because that is why I am sent. You see, it was the will of the Father that he come into our world, come into our time, okay, and preach the kingdom of God. So what it is also, it's an act of self-denial. He's, he's like Paul. He's not saying I need credit and whatever. No, you know, I'm done here. I got to move on. I have a lot to do, you see. And so even though the people, they, they probably, a lot of them still followed him. You'd have to, if you, when, you'd have to see where Simon, Simon's uh, house is on the Sea of Galilee, you know, so they're, they're, they're moving along there. I'm sure they followed him, but Jesus understands and he wants the disciples to understand that it's not a one-stop show. He has to move. He's a, that's why they call him an itinerant preacher. He moves from town to town, you see. So he resists the pleadings to return because he understands that his ministry must go out. So, and then 39, we'll close it with 39. So he went into their synagogues, preaching and driving out demons throughout the whole of Galilee. And that's very typical. You know, uh, where do they go? I, when I was teaching on Tuesday night, we were talking about Paul. Every time on Paul's journey, every time he went into a place, a town, the first place he went was to the synagogue. The first place. Jesus is the same thing. He enters the town. He goes to the synagogue. And there he preaches. He drives out demons. And then, again, continues his ministry outside there. But he always starts out in the house of the Father. Preaching and teaching. And he has the same thing as we know. Some accept it. Some, some scratch their head. Want, some want to stone him. You know. But he has a message. He has a mission. And so he can't stay in one place. That's his point. So he's not going to stay in Capernaum. They may follow him, probably did. But um, no, he, can't. he has to go to other villages. He has to go to other cities. He has a message that he has to get out. And so the disciples pick up, not totally understanding the theater. They never really understand the whole picture till the Holy Spirit comes. But they pick up and they follow him. Now, again, why would they follow him? so easily jesus has to be for lack of another term like a spiritual magnet to them you know their hearts have become one they're gonna you know they keep in mind they walked away from their fishing they walked away from everything so he's like a spiritual magnet that's what he is to us or should be to us he's a spiritual magnet that pulls us to him and so we need to find ways to draw ourselves to him 
And here again, he gets up. Nobody questions it and says, oh, why are we going? Or you know, can we go after lunch? No. They get up and they immediately follow him, you see. And so he goes into the next town, the next city, whatever, and continues preaching and healing. And he's doing, here's the thing. If you know what a Messiah does, the role of a Messiah is he takes care of his people. He heals his people. He feeds his people. He defends his people. Jesus does all of that. They just don't understand. They don't get it. They don't get it. That's why at no time did any of the Pharisees say, you're the Messiah. But if you look at the definition of the Messiah, what does the Messiah do? He does these four things. What is Jesus doing? These four things. Shouldn't he be the Messiah? They don't get it. They never got it. See? But they lean toward these false messiahs, these magicians or whatever. That's where they lean to. So Jesus makes makes it very clear. He's not a sideshow. He's not a sideshow. He has come with a message. And he's come with a mission. And that's his purpose. And nothing's going to stop him. Any questions or com more comments on this? Nothing. Cool. Okay. Okay. Well, it gives us some good insight because, as I said, what's happened here when he leaves Peter's house, he's taking the show on the road. He's taking the show on the road. And he knows he has work to do and he's going to do it. And hopefully the disciples are going to learn from him. And when they don't, he's going to explain to them. Peter even says it in one scripture, and I've used this example before. He, uh, Jesus gives this discourse, and Peter says, was that for us? And I love that line. You know, was that for us? And I can see Jesus saying, oh, good Lord. Yes, it was for you. Get a grip here. Yeah, it was for you. you know, so uh, again, he realizes that, again, he realizes the human condition and that he, at times he may be speaking at levels that they do not understand. And so he has to bring it again. What does he do? He brings it to their level. So they understand what he's talking about and they understand the message. So that after the Holy Spirit comes, they can go and they can spread the message and they can comfortably and bravely do it. That's the key. Now we know they're not brave because they leave them alone in the garden. So the bravery is out. You know, once that starts in the garden of Gethsemane, they're gone. So bravery isn't there yet. After the Holy Spirit comes, they're out there. They got it. They're linking everything together and they understand.